Welcome to Palmyra Grace Church's Sermon of the Week. At Palmyra Grace Church, our purpose is to help people pursue a life with God together on mission. To that end, our hope is that each Sunday message influences your Monday and every day of the week. For more information about Palmyra Grace Church, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or find us at palmyragrace.org. Now here's this week's Sermon of the Week. All right, wow, that was great. That was great. Hey, if this is your first week, you are jumping in on week four, actually, of a sermon series called The Kingdom Shaped Life. And uh, we have been looking at uh, the Sermon on the Mount, specifically in this portion, Matthew 6, and we'll be in Matthew 7 before the series is over. But we've actually been walking through the entire Sermon on the Mount throughout this year at different times. And so today we're going to be in Matthew 6. And I want to start there, if we could. Um, I'll have the words up on the screen in a little bit as we walk through the passage, verse by verse. But right now, I just want to read it out. Uh, so if you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn to Matthew chapter 6 with me. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can go there on your phone. Uh, also, there are Bibles on a table when you first walk into the room here. And um, if you don't have one with you, you can pick one up. If you don't own a Bible, you can take it with you when you leave. Um, and then you do own a Bible. Works pretty well that way, doesn't it? So um, please grab one on your way in. And, uh, but we're going to be in Matthew 6, starting at verse 25. I just want to read the words of the Lord over us as we begin. And this is what our Lord says. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any, of, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow, they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we wear, what sh or what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your fa heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we go to your word, we just ask that uh, you would give us ears to hear. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak through me and clearly through me, and that we would receive your word and God, we come to you and we believe that your word is truth and that as it is preached and as your Holy Spirit moves in our lives, you can pursue us, you can transform us from the inside out. And Lord, we believe that this time that we have today, that we set aside each and every Sunday, isn't just a ritual and it's not a moment in time that we set aside because we just want to have our heads filled with more knowledge. God, we ask, we come to you and ask that you would use this time to make us more like your son, Jesus. As we go before the word, Lord, open our hearts to it. We believe that you can do this. We know that only you can do this. So we set aside this time in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning, um, I got a lot of saying and not a lot of time to do it. So buckle up. Um, I'm going to let you a little bit into my mind this morning, which Phil just made that face. Yeah, this is terrifying. Um, it's scary for me too, guys. We're in it together. Um, why, why, uh, why, this, why this sermon and why, am I, why was I led to preach through these, these, uh, these teachings of Jesus from this direction? Kingdom-shaped life, if you've been here, I've, I've been sharing each and every week 
about the fact that there's no such thing as a neutral shaping, that we're either being shaped by what the New Testament writers call the world, or we're being shaped by Christ, his teachings formed in the image of Christ. And our mission here as a church is to help you pursue a life with God, help you pursue a life shaped by God, a personal relationship with God. Together we do this, a life together as a community of faith on mission to the world. We are missionaries, each and every one of us. If we said yes to Jesus, the day we said yes to Jesus wasn't so we could just just get a ticket to heaven. It was so that we could, while he is tarrying and until he returns, we can bring the reality of heaven on earth through our lives to people each and every day. And as we live out that mission, as we are pursuing that mission, the way that we're going to be able to do that is if Christ is formed in us and the kingdom, the reality of God's kingdom is formed in our lives. And this is so important. And here, let, me, let me share why. Because if you didn't realize this, culture has shifted in powerful ways. Our culture right now is very different from the culture of our grandparents and our great-grandparents. And the culture that you go into each and every week is shaping you in ways very differently than it did 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And the reality is, is as a pastor, my job is to prepare you for that so that you can live a missionary lifestyle. Because the way that our culture is right now is different from how it used to be because nobody is coming here to learn about truth. Unless they were Christians or unless there was something that happened in their lives, they're not coming here. They no longer seek this building or my voice as the person that's going to help them until they first encounter you. So therefore, the way that I do church, the way that I lead this church can't be that we build a big attractional thing to make people come. It has to be that I equip you to go. And then once they encounter you and they encounter your love and they encounter the the Jesus in your life and through your life, maybe just maybe then they will fall in love with him and they'll want to be part of his people and join his mission. And now, see, like I said before, you out there is different. I'm going to teach a lot today and it's, it's going to be deep, but I know you guys can handle it. I, I wrestle with the Lord all week. This passage is so good. And this passage is self-evident. Quite honestly, Jesus is so practical in this passage, and I want to say as I start out, reading this passage and taking it at face value can change your life. And I don't mean to take away from God's word or even add to God's word. What I want to do is expand what he's talking about from our individual lives so that we understand this kingdom-shaped life and what the world's shaping us to and how it causes worry in our lives. All right? So let me explain three things very quickly. In Mark Sayers' book, Disappearing Church, he quotes this social historian named Philip Reef. And Philip Reef explains that culture, he sees cultures in three different ways since Christianity. The first type of culture is a pre-Christian culture. And a pre-Christian culture is a culture that has often pagan beliefs, many gods. Think about the culture that Jesus spoke into when he spoke to those that were in the Roman Empire with Greek gods and the Roman gods, you know, Zeus and Mars. Remember learning about this in school? And those, that was one type of culture. And they, they, they believed that the way that they would live in the world was to make sure those gods were happy or do things to appease those gods. And they had a lot of worry because they weren't sure whether those gods were going to be upset with them or not or whether what they did for those gods was going to actually help them. And then the culture changed and there became Christian cultures. And after the movement of Jesus and the, the early followers, it moved all over the world and cultures started to become Christianized. And our culture was the same. Our ancestors and those that, for most of us, came from from European backgrounds and other cultures where Christ brought the culture into our lives and then we didn't know anything different. And those Christian cultures were marked by things that were very different from the pagan cultures because a Christian culture did many different things. One of the number one things a Christian culture did was elevate the value of a human life. You, there's not, in history, if you look, there's not one place where Christianity didn't enter a culture and things like care for women and things like care for children didn't elevate because of Christian life. Morals and values and ethics that we think are just normal actually weren't normal until Christ changed culture. All right, you with me? And even though we didn't do it perfect, and even though you can look back on every Christian culture and say they missed it at some places, Certainly in our own culture, we certainly missed it when it was valuing what Scripture would say was the value of every person regardless of the color of their skin. 
Even with that, we still had in our culture, in our nation, a value and an ethic and morality that was shared amongst most people. Your grandparents and your great-grandparents grew up with that. It's what they knew, and that's what they expected. And in case you didn't know, that's what Phil Brief calls a Christian culture. And in case you didn't know, we are not in that culture anymore. America is not a Christian nation. Europe is not a Christian nation. We are in a post-Christian world. That's where we're at. And the post-Christian world's very different. But before I get there, let me explain something to you. At one point in time, the people that lived in a Christian culture sent missionaries to the pre-Christian cultures. You know this, we still send missionaries to pre-Christian cultures. And the biggest danger that missionaries have realized when you send a Christian to a pre-Christian culture is that the Christians not only would reach the pre-Christian culture with Jesus, but that would make them look more like the culture that came. In other words, Europeans sent missionaries to Africa. Not only did they reach them with Jesus, but they made them Europeans. This is why we have churches in Africa with lots of people that are African that dress like Europeans and sing hymns by dead white guys. Because not only did we reach them with the gospel, but we colonized them. And we've realized that that was a mistake. The best way we could have done mission work that way would have been to go there, introduce them to Jesus, and then help them discover what it looks like to be a Christian and African, as opposed to being a Christian and European. Now, why do I share that? Because what Reef points out is that the danger when you're a Christian and you go into a post-Christian culture, which is what I prepare you all to do every single week, is not that we will make the culture like us, but that the culture will make us like them. I'm going to say that again. The danger when Christians enter a post-Christian culture is not that we will make the culture like us, it's that the culture will make us like them. And brothers and sisters, this post-Christian culture is affecting each and every one of us more than we know it on a daily basis. And we have to pursue a kingdom-shaped life more each and every day. The shape that I'm going to be talking about this week is the wheel. It looks kind of like a wagon wheel like you'd see on an Amish buggy, so we should be able to roll with that in Lebanon County, yeah? But Jesus is talking more about the culture. I'm going to give, this is all going to make sense when we get to the end, hopefully. But Jesus is talking about worry in our passage today. Specifically, how we live in a life of worry. And when we think about worry and why that plays into how our culture is shaping us is because what we worry about is usually defined by our priorities. Yeah? I mean, I don't know about you. I never worry about things I don't care about. So what we worry about is defined by our priorities. And here's the thing. Our priorities are usually determined by our beliefs. Because if we don't believe in it, we don't make it a priority. And so we have to look very carefully as we live in a post-Christian culture, how we are being formed by the world and how our beliefs are being informed. Because it will link to what is our beliefs and it will link to what we worry about. And in our post-Christian world, when we don't have a shared Christian context, when we don't have shared morals, when we don't have shared beliefs, we're going to worry about things that maybe we shouldn't. You see, in a post-Christian world, this kingdom-shaped, not a kingdom-shaped world, but a, a post-Christian-shaped world, there's a power that swirls around this small number of beliefs that Mark Sayers talks about in his book, Disappearing Church. It's actually a book about why the church is disappearing. It's a great name, right? I love people that name things the way that I don't have to think about it too heavily. But he talks about the seven beliefs that are shaping us in a post-Christian world, that are shaping us to the look more like the world than the church. And here's the seven that he mentions, and I think they're spot on. They're deep, but stick with me. The first one is this, that the highest good is individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression. That the highest good in, in our lives is these three things, or four things, right? It's the most important thing that we all fo focus on. To the degree, number two, that any tradition, any religion, any wisdom, any regulation, any show, social tie that restricts individual freedom, individual happiness, individual self-definition, self-expression, 
must be reshaped, deconstructed, or destroyed, and I will add, or defunded. Second thing. The third thing. That the world is inevitably going to improve as the scope of individual freedom grows. The more everybody gets to define things the way they want to, the world's going to get better. And the way it's going to happen is technology, in particular the internet, is going to motor this progression toward utopia. We just need more technology. The better the phones get, the better the computers get, the better the cars drive themselves. Man, we're just going to meet, reach this place where utopia is found. This is what's underneath all of the world we live in right now. That the primary social ethic is tolerance for everyone's self-defined quest for individual freedom and self-expression. Any deviation from this ethic of tolerance is dangerous and must not be tolerated. Number four, folks, is what's called cancel culture. It's what it's called. Listen, the primary social ethic is that you must tolerate how I define things. Therefore, if your way of defining things is different from how I define things in a way in which you make me feel bad because of my self-expression, and therefore by your self-expression, you say my self-expression isn't, isn't right, then I can't be in relationship with you and I need to cancel you. Am I wrong? Is Sarah's wrong? No. This is shaping our world right now. The fourth, fifth one, that humans are inherently good. This is... Therefore, how I identify myself on the inside, because I'm inherently good, must be affirmed by those on the outside. Right? If not, then you're not good. Because I'm inherently good. Number six, large-scale structures and institutions are suspicious at best and evil at worst. So the church is not the place to come find information because they're evil. They've got another motive. Number six, seven, forms of external authority are rejected and personal authenticity is lauded. See, pre-Christianity and post-Christianity are two different things. And what post-Christianity is trying to do is it's trying to, this is according to Sayers, it's attempting to move beyond Christianity while simultaneously benefiting from its fruit. It's trying to grab and retain the benefits of Christianity, which are peace and the elevation of human value and having individual free will and allowing that to exist. It's, it wants those good things from Christianity, but it no longer wants the cost, commitments, and restraints that the gospel of Jesus Christ would put on the individual will. It post-Christianity yearns for justice and the peace of the kingdom without defending, while defending the reign of the individual will. That's what Sarah says. I put it this way. What does it mean to live in a post-Christian world? It means we live in a world where people want the benefits of the kingdom without the king. That's what we live in. You want to understand how the world shapes you the other seven days or six days that you're not here on a Sunday morning? It shapes you by telling you this, that the good life is actually reduced to individual autonomy and personal happiness. And as long as that's where I'm at, life's good. And you know what the problem with that is? As Christian people, you know what the biggest problem with that when it comes to the passage we face today? It's this. When life's all about you, it's actually all up to you. When life's all about you, it's all up to you. To get that good life, it's all up to you. It's up to your work. It's up to your striving. It's up to everything about you. And you know what that is a recipe for? Anxiety. Depression. Stress. And then when we can't handle the anxiety, the depression, and the stress, we use substance abuse. Or we have, because of technology, more, more amusements than ever, so we can just check out. It also ends up being, when it's all about us, a culture where we're more divided than ever. Now, when I'm talking about worry, I want to make sure I make very clear about this. I am not talking, when I say anxiety or worry today, about biochemical needs that require medical intervention, like medicine. I'm not talking about anxiety that's a true diagnosis that actually could be from a trauma experience or something like that. Those are real issues, and there's real need for people to go to counseling, people to take medication, people to be treated for those things. So I'm not saying that. 
And I'm also not talking about the anxiety that's actually real anxiety, that's a rational response to things, because God gave us our emotions, one of them being anxiety, to actually let us know when things aren't good. And we should respond to those things by understanding that they may be actually places where we need to flee or fight, right? That's like part of our anatomy. But what I am talking about is the worry that is in each and every one of us because we are forced by the culture to believe that everything is about us and we are actually living lives that we were never meant to carry. When it's all about you, it's all up to you. And in that, Jesus speaks to us today. And what this passage does, Jesus addresses the worries of his audience. Now, the worries of his audience are more basic than ours, but they still, like ours, deal with our individual lives and the things that dominate us and our minds about what we worry about. And to that, Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. I don't think there's any other words in Scripture that Jesus speaks that I've ever wanted to say, yeah, right. Right? Yeah, right. But he says, don't worry about your life. And he talks about the basic things that individuals need. Don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than these things? Jesus isn't telling us to despise the pleasures of life because he recognizes we need things that are welfare for the welfare of the body, like food, like clothes, like warmth, like cooling when it's hot, like refreshment, like rest, like entertainment. I think we even need that, right? Human beings wouldn't have created games if it wasn't part of what we needed. But the fact is what Jesus is saying is that when we look at our lives as a re- with a reductionistic view that really it's all about me and what I need. We're living the post-Christian gospel of self rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus points outside of ourselves and he points to nature to help us understand the heart of God in all of us. He says, look at the birds of the air. The birds of the air, they don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? If you have your Bible out, I would underline that. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Now, Jesus is not calling us to laziness by pointing to the birds and saying, look, they don't store up anything and God takes care of them, so you just kick back, relax, and don't do anything. He's going to take care of you anyway. No, birds instinctively look for food. In fact, out of the nature, birds are always very busy. They're not lazy at all. They're always looking for their next food. So he's not saying that you just kick back and relax. And he's not saying that if you believe that the Heavenly Father is going to take care of you, that you're never going to have problems in life. But what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to point us to lower creation, to to birds, and saying, if God takes care of birds, why do you think he won't take care of you, those of you who are his sons and daughters? Why do you believe that when it's all about me and I've got to do everything for myself, you actually leave God out out of the scenario? He goes on and he gives another example. He says, and why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field, they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So Jesus says, look at the flowers of the field. Look how beautiful they are. And if God is so faithful to the things that are perishable, to take care of them with even beauty, how do you think he's going to treat those of you who are imperishable? Because if you put your faith in Christ, you're going to live forever. You're his forever. He's going to keep you, what we just sang about. So if he makes the flowers look beautiful every spring, what do you think he's, how do you think he's going to treat you who are his forever? Jesus says, if you don't believe in that, you have little faith. (laughs) One theologian, Robert Mounts, says this. What Jesus is trying to say here is that if you worry, you're actually living in practical atheism. You actually believe that God doesn't exist. It's practical atheism to worry about things that God will do for you. So then Jesus goes on and he says, so do not worry. 
saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Don't worry about these things. The pagans run after these things. So don't worry about all these individual needs. Don't worry about the, all those things so much and be caught up in all of these things. Like he goes after the basic, eat, drink, or wear. But man, there's a lot of things that we run after that we worry about, right? Especially when we make all of our lives about us. We're consumed by our needs because guess what? We'll never get to the place where we'll find peace when we are the Lord of our own lives. He says, your heavenly father knows that you need them. And he says the pagans run after them. You see, because like I shared before, in a pre-Christian culture, pagans worried about these things because they were dominated by fears that the tyrannical gods would be moody and what they did to keep them happy wouldn't work. That's how they were dominated. Now, we may not believe in that. You probably don't worship Zeus you know, or ever had a, a tendency where you felt like you needed to, you know, worship Hermes or anything like that. But in our post-Christian culture, we're, instead of a, a pre-Christian culture, instead of worshiping other gods, we often are tempted to worship the God of self. And God is saying that when we worry about those things, we are doing the same thing as the secular world. So what's the antidote that Jesus gives us? He says very simply, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Man, if you write in your Bible, which I hope you do because it's just fun, I would underline or circle all these things. I ask you this morning, what are all these things for you? What is all these things? What are the things that you worry about? What are all the details of life that keep you up at night? What are the all these things? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Friends, as we think about the way that we just saw that the world wants to shape us and the way that God is calling us to be shaped in kingdom-shaped lives. What Jesus is saying is that I'm not ignoring the fact that there are things in your life that you need, but rather than make those needs and yourself the center, it's because you believe that chasing after them is going to lead to the good life. Chase after me. In other words, the good life is the kingdom-centered life. The good life isn't about self-autonomy and self-expression. The good life is the kingdom-centered life. You see, because our culture wants to shape us this way, here's our wagon wheel. It wants to put the hub of our life as me, right? And when I'm the center of my life and I am the Lord of my life, then I worry about how money's affecting me or how many friends that I have or how much sex I'm having or how, many, how are my kids doing or how, do I have enough time in my day and, and how is it affecting me and how are other people's encroachments on my time affecting me and whether I could do my hobbies and how does my politics affect me and how does my work affect me and what the world wants to shape us to is that we we are the center of our lives and we need to focus on me. And when it's all up to me, when it's all about me, it's all up to me. And what Jesus says is that this life is a recipe for worry. That this will do nothing to bring the peace that God wants to give you. And you can trade out me for other things that seem a little bit less punchy, but they are the same thing. It's all about my success. The success that brings me money, the success that brings me the friends I want, the success, the success that makes my kid, you know, my kid's success actually defines my identity. My success is influenced by my kid's success. Or my time is determined by my success. Or I, my success is determined by which of my politicians is my choice that sits in the White House. 
or our money to be in the center. And everything we have is seen through the view of how much money we have. And how we invest our money is influenced by that being in the center. Students in middle school and high school and young adults, I see time and time again them struggling often with their friends and their friends become the center and how their friends think about them and how they'll see, look in the eyes of their friends can dominate the way they think about the rest of their lives. Our me-shaped gospel of self-shaped culture has put sex in the center. And many times we've actually gotten to the place where my sexual identity is the primary thing about me and everything else in my life is filtered through that. And we're teaching, the culture is teaching people that how you identify yourself is something that you define on the inside apart from anything else, even God himself. And you will not find peace until you actually understand that and live in your true self, defined by the inside. And we have an entire culture that's waged war because they believe that until that is, until the culture itself affirms sex as the center of their lives and everyone's lives, they'll never find peace. I, am, I, am I wrong? And we can point to that. You can say, oh yeah, amen. But we're all guilty of putting something here in the center, whether it's kids or time. And Jesus says, if you do this, if you allow this life to drive you, you're going to be consumed with worry because you're never going to find the good life that way. But you know what he does say? If you want all these things, your heavenly father already knows that you need them. Therefore, seek the kingdom first and his righteousness and all these things will be given unto you. That's what he says. But the, the culture we live in, each and every week as I think about sending you out as missionaries in this world, I know that the pressures of this world, the gospel of self in this world, is forming you on a regular basis that it's all about you and that your maximum peace and satisfaction, the good life for you is going to only happen when everything you want and everything you desire is affirmed and you get what you finally want, which is self-autonomy and self-expression and the good life is found there. And it's not working. I worked through this all week. And man, I'll tell you what. Holy Spirit gave me some lumps. As we fought through this. And Jesus says, this isn't to beat you up. This isn't meant to feel guilty about any of you. Who the Son set free is free indeed. If he knows you need all these things. So the invitation is not to be shaped by the culture, the invitation is to be shaped by the kingdom. Because here's the thing. When it's all about you, it's all up to you. And your heavenly father says, I am the giver of all that you need. Seek me. Seek my kingdom. Seek my righteousness. And what? All these things. The good life is the kingdom-centered life. I wonder, what's in your center? I wonder what you've placed there. Have you experienced what I have, that when I move something other than the kingdom there, it becomes an obsession? Have you experienced what I have that when I move something in the center and I filter everything through one of those things, that it becomes something that plagues me with worry, anxiety, can't eat, can't sleep, can't ever find peace? 
Have you experienced what I have that when I finally get whatever it is that I thought I wanted it when I put it in the center, that I found out that it didn't work, so I took it and I put it in one of the spokes and I grabbed something else and put it in the center? Right? Man, I've done this. I've done it with all of them. I've done it with politics. I've done it with sex. I've done it with money. And I'm the pastor, so I'm supposed to be holy or something, right? I've done it with all those things. I've had sleepless nights. I've worried about it all. I've been shaped by it all. And the one thing, the one truth that I know is that I have a father who's called me son, who delights in me and wants to give me all that I need. And his invitation of me is to seek first my kingdom. To seek first my righteousness and then all these things. The peace that you want. The satisfaction that you want. The desires that you want. Filtered through my kingdom, my purposes, my love and the king and lord of life as the center of my life. Only then do I find the satisfaction I'm looking for. Only then do I find the peace that I'm looking for. Only then am I able to truly find what my heart resonates inside of me and says, you know what, this, only under his lordship, only under his kingdom, do I truly find that which is good. And brothers and sisters, if we don't get this, we can never reach the world because what we've seen and what we know is if we don't live kingdom-shaped, kingdom-centered lives, then the world's going to shape us differently. And the world is looking for something different. Because the world, if it isn't working, if social media and the internet and all of these things that we have in this world and self-expression and self-autonomy worked, then the news feeds that you watch and the newspapers, if anybody reads those still, that you read and the news stations that you listen to wouldn't sound the way that they are. We, we have a world that is lost, that is anxious, that is depressed and is more angry toward the other than ever before because they believe they're going to find the good life in themselves. And we have something so much better to offer them. The kingdom and the king. Let's pray. Thanks for joining us for this sermon of the week. If you found this sermon helpful, please share it with a friend in person or on social media. Let us know you were here by going to palmyragrace.org slash I was here. You can also sign up for our news and events at palmyragrace.org slash resources. We hope God spoke to you today and that you can share his good news with someone this week.